reading today will be reading by the New International Version. And today's reading is Luke 4, 16 through 21. And he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went to the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I'll be reading Matthew 16, 13 through 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do you people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is the reading of the word of God for the people of God. Let's see if the microphone will work now. Is it on? Technical errors. You test everything twice and nothing ever goes exactly as planned, but maybe it shouldn't. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we give you thanks that you are indeed among us. Speak to our hearts today, O oh God. Open our eyes so that we can see the world as you see it. Open our ears to hear what you would have for us today. Give us boldness so that we can go forth and live out our faith as your hands and feet in this world. Amen. Riley, will you hand me my water there? I walked up here to the stage and forgot it. I won't make it through a sermon without it. Lingering side effects. Jesus bluntly announced in his hometown of Nazareth that he was indeed the promised Messiah. He was the promised one. The one that, that God's people, the nation of Israel, had been searching for. And those closest to him, they missed it. They missed it. I mean, after all, he was just a carpenter's son. He was the same kid they had watched grow up. He was the same young boy that played with their children. He was the same young lad that threw rocks at stuff he wasn't supposed to, skipped them along the creek, Got dirty, disobeyed his mother, I'm sure. That can't be a sin, can it, since Jesus was perfect? Got scolded by his mother for wandering too far off, right? Being place he wasn't supposed to be, staying gone too long. I mean, I don't think we ever pictured Mary coming to the door of whatever house they lived in, shouting, Jesus, come home. That was what the people of Nazareth knew. He was a carpenter's son. He was ordinary. He was plain. He was nothing spectacular. Really? Jesus is the promised one? Wouldn't God's plan be grander than this? And so they missed it. He told them, I've been sent to bring good news to the poor. 
I've been sent to proclaim freedom for the captives, to give recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, announcing that the year of the Lord's favor had finally come to Israel. Really? Jesus? I mean, after all, he had been in the tabernacle or the temple in, 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 uh, in the synagogue in Nazareth over and over again. This is where he grew up. And all of a sudden, he's reading from the scroll of Isaiah proclaiming, This is me. Today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And those closest to him missed it. After calling his disciples from their, their simple lives of, of working for themselves... He called them to a life of loving and serving others. They witnessed miracles, right? They saw lives being transformed before them. They participated. They participated in his ministry. And yet they still doubted. They still wondered. They still, they still weren't sure. So Jesus asked him, he said, who do people say that I am? What are they talking about me? What are they saying? The disciples, I think they they stuttered and they stammered over themselves. They scrolled through that newsreel in their mind, you know, the one thinking back to the miracles, thinking back to the ones that had been fed, thinking back to the ones that had walked, that had seen for the first time, that had talked, those that had left everything and were following along with them. They were going through that newsreel in their mind. And then they stuttered and stammered and said, John the Baptist, some people, some people say John the baptizer because, you know, John had been beheaded, but, but Jesus must be John reincarnated. As ridiculous as it sounded, Jesus must be John reincarnated. And then they, they said some people are saying Elijah, that great prophet Elijah. He had not died after all. He'd been taken up into heaven. And Scripture said that he would come before the promised one. You must be Elijah. Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet, was called at a very young age, a young boy. He mourned over the wanderings of Israel, begging God's people, return to God. Return to the ways that you've been taught. Jesus, some people say you're Jeremiah. Finally, one of them said, They also say you could be one of the other prophets. You know, Elisha, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Zechariah. You know, one of those people that their forefathers rejected. They'd only read about them in the, the scrolls. They say that you're one of those prophets come to deliver the good news about the promised one. They say you're just another prophet. Then Jesus flipped it on them. He said, well, that's what they say. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? Now, before we go any further with this part of the story, okay, I want to put this in proper context for you. The location is key here. Jesus and his disciples were just outside of Caesarea Philippi, okay? It's in the Golan Heights, the northern part of Israel, along what is now the Lebanese border. You all are looking at me going, that makes no difference to me whatsoever. Let me proceed, okay? This is just off of Mount Hermon, okay? And water flows down off of the mountaintop where there's usually snow. And there is a spring that gushes forth. This is the headwaters of the Jordan River at Caesarea Philippi. This running, gushing water provides life to the entire region and feeds the Sea of Galilee. The entire nation, whether they recognize it or not, this is the point from which their living water flows. 
the wellspring of their life begins in this location. Also, Caesarea Philippi is also the location of the grotto Pan. The Greek god Pan, who is the god of desolate places. Still today, I've been there, I've seen it. There's a big grotto that's carved out of, and it's an outdoor sanctuary, carved out of the limestone. And, and it, there's cliffs, and into the cliffs, there are little niches that are carved out into all of these cliffs. And people would place various gods into these niches or they would light candles and place into those niches in honor of certain gods people would come here to worship the gods of their world they would bring candles incense vegetables fruits flowers offer offer them as offerings to their pagan gods And people would pray. Pray to the statues of these lifeless and dead gods. This is the location which I do not believe was an accident. Jesus is standing in front of these cliffs with all of these lifeless and dead gods. It's a setting for the scripture that Mike read for us today in Matthew 16. The worthless gods of this world are the backdrop. And Jesus says to them, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? What are they saying about me? John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, some other prophet. And he said, but what about you? What about you? Who do you say that I am? It was in that moment that Simon's heart, we know him as Peter. He was Simon. Simon's heart was was ripped open. His mind was transformed with the truth of the gospel. Standing in front of all of the lifeless and dead gods of this world, he proclaimed, Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. Boldly and confidently he proclaimed, you're the one that we've been waiting for. Our hope, our salvation rests in you. Jesus, you and you alone can save us. I picture Jesus smiling when he said this next part. He looked at him and he said, Simon, today you've become Cephas, which is Greek for Peter. You have become Cephas. You are Peter, which means rock. On this rock, on this confession that you have made today, I will build my church you and your confession are the bedrock of our faith and the gates of Hades will not be able to stand against it from that point forward he was no longer Simon he was Peter he was the rock we know that the rock faltered don't we the rock wavered but Jesus saw past what he knew he would do what he knew he would not do. And he still, he announced, you're the rock, Peter. It's you. And at Pentecost, we know what happened, which we call the birthday of the church. Big C, capital C, the birthday of the church. Peter preached thousands of people. And what did he preach? Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Believe in Him. Receive God's grace, free and without price. Claim this truth and then go and live out your faith. What are the lifeless and worthless gods of our world? Standing before the lifeless, worthless gods of our world we're often asked the exact same question. Whom will you worship? But what about you? Who do you say that I am? And that's what today is about. It's why we've made such a big deal about today. Because 
our confirmation students are answering the question with, Jesus, you are my Messiah. Jesus, you're the son of the only one, the only true, the only living God. Jesus, my hope is in you. I dedicate my body, my mind, and my spirit to you. That's the commitment that they're making. That's the commitment that those of you who are gathered here in support of them are being asked to make as well. It's the commitment that we are asked to make every Sunday. The confirmation students learned it's no accident that we gather on Sundays. It's no accident. We gather on Sunday, the first day of the week, every week, to shout and proclaim, Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the one who has been resurrected from the grave. That's why we gather on Sundays and shout praises to his name is because he's the only one that can save us. They also learned what makes us Christian. What separates us from all the other lifeless, worthless gods of the world? And we believe, we believe that our God is three in one. We sing about it today, right? Holy, holy, holy. God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Not three gods, one God in three persons. Our students learned about God the Father, the one who we pray to, the one who we bring our petitions to. Our students learned about God the Son, Jesus Christ the Messiah, the one sent to save us from our sins, in whom our faith we believe without Jesus Christ, without his sacrificial love demonstrated by his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave, Our eternal life, our salvation is not possible. God the Son ascended into heaven, part of the Apostles' Creed, seated at the right hand of the Father, the seat of power, the seat of authority, the judgment seat, the right hand of the King. We pray through Jesus Christ. And gain access as our intercessor to God the Father. God the Holy Spirit. At the crucifixion, the curtain was torn. The veil was torn. You remember that in the crucifixion story at Easter? We talk about the curtain being torn, except it was torn from top to bottom. And it was split. That was the Holy of Holies. That was the symbolism of God in their world. And that curtain was split. And some think so that it was because we could finally gain access to this holy God. But I believe that the curtain was torn because it is the first time that the Holy Spirit was let out of the temple. And the Holy Spirit said, you're all the temple of the Lord. And the Holy Spirit was sent to dwell in the hearts and minds of God's people. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our kids learn that baptism, baptism is a ritual. It's a metaphor. Jesus said you need to be born of water and the Spirit. Why is that important? We all know that you're born through the waters of birth. Nicodemus said, well, how can this be? How can this be? Through the waters of baptism. It's a metaphor for our sins being washed away. It's a metaphor for new life. It's a metaphor for I have been identified with Christ. Water symbolizes life. I've been made new. And it is through baptism 
when we baptize infants that we are claiming they are marked by God and identified with Jesus Christ. It is through the remembering and renewal of our baptismal vows that we are reclaiming as if for the very first time. It's why after the service, the water will be out there in the baptismal font. You're all welcome to go and reclaim your baptismal vows with water at some point as you leave. The last few weeks I've asked you, dream big and invest in the vision. What are we dreaming big about and what vision are you investing in? But what about you? Who do you say that I am? The dream, the vision was all started on Peter, the rock. That confession, it is the bedrock of our faith. And God's people must say, Jesus, you are my Messiah. You are the son of my living God. You and you alone can save us.